Okay, so from last week, uh, we learned um, how to combine the chapter four rows together, and so that um, the individual consumer and the individual firms are um, in the same model, and they interact. And we saw for a general or basic equilibrium ideas in this model. And last week, beyond that, we show how um, the increase in G has an effect, effect on C, uh, consumption, leisure, GDP, and wage. Okay, so that was a pure uh, wealth effect. And we sort of stopped right here last week, where we want to discuss an increase in Z or K. I mean, they are essentially the same thing. Depends on your assumptions about the model, okay, about the specific function form of F. Oh, that will decide uh, whether they, their effects are exactly the same or slightly different, but the basic general idea are always the same. Okay, in that case, the PPF will shift out. Okay, so you remember Z, Z is what means by uh, we call total factor productivity, right? So total factor productivity act like a technology. Okay, so if technology goes up, that means um, your output is gonna go up. So PPF is gonna shift outside. Okay. And it's just not out, not just outside, because remember when, uh, so that's not like purely making everything proportionally better, okay? Because that depends on how many hours do people work in the equilibrium. Okay, so suppose nobody works, n is zero, then the, uh, the function f will, will out, give an output of zero then the increase of K or increase of Z doesn't really matter. Okay, so it's an unproportional increase. Okay. And when it is an unproportional increase, what happened to the C, L, Y, and W? The idea is actually uh, quite simple. Okay, let's, uh, let's uh, give you the answer first and also give you a intuition behind it, and let, then let's see the graph. Okay, so generally speaking, C is definitely going to increase. The leisure actually might increase or decrease. The Y is going to be increasing, and the W is increasing. Okay, and why is that the case? So if the technology is getting better, the production is getting better, PPF ship out, that means if even with, if we just keep the same amount of labor, then we will get more output. And if we have more output, that means we are more uh, wealthy. So by, by definition, you must consume more. That for sure. And why must increase? That for sure. But how about leisure? Leisure is simply the inverse of your labor, right? That's H minus uh, N, the labor. Or H minus L is labor. So they're the same thing. So um, think of this. If your productivity is getting better, does that mean you will work more? Definitely work more or work less? That depends. Right? Depends on how much those work value to you. So that is, that is, that is like, suppose spending one hour, okay, give you an extreme example. Suppose spending one hour, you can uh, clean up your, 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 your dorm, your whole dorm or your, your bed, okay, or your, your, your back in your family home. You spend one hour, you can clean the whole place. But now, because of the technology, for example, you buy a, you know, those iRobot or, you know, those automatically machine robot that helps you clean the floor. Now you only need to spend 40 minutes to clean the whole house. That's technology improvement. In that case, because your goal is very simple, you want to clean the whole place. So in that case, you definitely gonna work less. You actually definitely work less. But in some cases, that's like, 
if your efficiency is getting better, some some something like uh, suppose this is a study, okay, studying studying uh, maybe macroeconomic or macroeconomic, okay. Obviously, there is no really a bound upper bound there. You can spend a lot of hour, but you still didn't get a hundred point in the exam, right? So, but now suppose your study is getting more efficient. That might mean you spend more hours on study because you feel like it's easier for you to succeed in the test, right? So that actually depends on the model assumption, depends on the parameter, you will see different effect. What about wage? Wage basically reflect the marginal productivity of labor, right? In equilibrium, W must equal MPL. And here, because either Z or K increase will definitely increase the MPL for any level of L. Okay, so in that case, you will see the wage must go up. So there's another way to see this. Suppose, consider this. So who, who have a job right now? A, maybe you work at a restaurant or a coffee shop. Who, who work there? Who, who has a work right now? Nobody? Okay, suppose you did that in undergrad. Okay, and back then the minimum wage was pretty much what you would earn in 7-Eleven or, or those uh, drink shop, right? Um, that was maybe 130 or 160 at best because only this year we increased it to 160 and eight, right? 160 and eight. So when the, um, when the wage increase, there are two effects here. One is that if you work the same hour as before, you will earn more, right? But there's another effect, which is you don't, another thing, way of thinking this is that you don't need to work that many hours, but you can still earn as much as before. So think of this, if your wage per hour wage increase, do you want to work more or less or actually the same? You will find that that's actually not a certain thing. Also depends on the current wage level. Okay, for example, suppose you earn $2,000 per hour right now. Then a increase of $100 probably you, you feels like, I mean, I earn enough. I would rather decrease a little bit. But if you earn really the minimum wage right now, an increase in minimum wage might mean you want to work more. Okay, so there are two effects here. Actually, that is the wealth effect and substitution effect. Okay, what is the, so this is what I mean by not proportional increase. You will see that, so what I mean is this increase of uh, production function, it didn't increase like this. It's not a, pro it's not a constant increase, okay? Rather, it starts at the same origin and then fades out like this. So here is small. Here the difference is large. Okay? And if that's the case, that's how the PPF gonna look like. Remember, we inverse, we give it inverse and you can convert the PPF, sorry, the production function to PPF. That's what we taught last week. This is essentially the inverse of a, P, uh, of a production function and you, you move it down by G, remember? So that, this is the PPF. This is PPF2, the new PPF. This is the old PPF, PP, uh, PPF1. Okay. This is the origin point here, the same point. Okay. So when this is face out, you can see this graph, what I draw is a case where leisure doesn't change. Okay, this is your original indifference curve. Now this is the new indifference curve. And you maximize, your maximized consumption bundle move from F to H. 
Then you can see that the C increase, but the L is the same thing. And if C increase, G doesn't change. Y equal to C plus G, so Y must increase. And wage is what? Wage is the slope here. It's clearly that this slope is steeper, right? The slope is steeper means wage is higher. This is all from last week. How are we going to see this? Okay, we use the same idea what we learn from microeconomics and what we actually do, I think, also in chapter four, is we separate, we disentangle these two effects of income and substitution effect. So the idea here, again, is if you have this original point, maximization point A, and you now move for B, to move to B. What I'm gonna do here is, I'm gonna move back your budget constraint. In here, the budget constraint is the PPF. You move the budget constraint down parallelly so that it, it acts like a purely pure income effect. Right? You, you basically decrease his wealth level. And to what level? To the level where this person in, enjoy the same level of utility. So basically, this is the new, this is the compensated budget constraint or compensated PPF. This line is tango, tangent to the uh, original indifference curve. That's, and this D point is called a compensated bundle. Basically, this D point is where the income effect is moved away. So from A to D, that's purely the substitution effect. And from D to B, that's the income effect. And you can see that both the substitution effect and the income effect increase C. The idea is that if the relative price between consumption and leisure increase, then I will consume more, right? And then the other idea is when I get wealthier, I will consume more. Both directions indicate that you will consume more. So C definitely increase. But the SCE make L decrease and the income effect make L increase. So there's a chance that these two cancel out each other. And that's why you may get a result that L is increasing, decreasing, or unchanged. Either way is possible. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is the sort of most difficult model in chapter, oh, not really. At least in the first part, that's the most difficult effect we're gonna look like. Uh, the, the last two models are a variation of this traditional uh, simple model. So some people might find it even more difficult, but some people might find it easier. It depends. Uh, so anyway, any questions about what we just talked about? It is a really good training for you guys to try to ask questions. Believe it or not, that's actually, if you learn to ask more questions, that makes your master thesis more successful. Your master thesis basically is a process of you asking when research questions. And you might find it actually difficult in the beginning to actually ask a good question or to define what is a good question. At least in the class, well, it should actually be easier for you to just ask a questions. Just ask the thing that you don't understand. If you feel a little bit confused, you, you, you're not sure. Just try to ask a question. It's a really good training for you. Okay, like I said, you can ask the question in Chinese. It doesn't have to be English. But if you want to ask them in English, of course, it's, it's welcome. Okay? Okay, so remember, Z 
Empirically, it's what we call a solo residual. We define this idea of solo residual from last chapter, if you recall them. The idea is that Z is something we cannot measure directly. But we have what? We have K, we have N, labor, we have production, the Y. So we can back, and we also have alpha, and we assume the alpha is the parameter for the copd uh, production function. So we can back out the uh, level of Z in that year or that season. So we sometimes call Z the solo residual. And what you see here, the, uh, the black line is the trend of solo residual. And the blue line is the uh, GDP. And this is what we call a deviation from trend graph. What is a deviation from trend? Do anybody know what this is? Anyone? No? What is deviation? What is deviation? Come on, you should know this word. No one want to answer? What is trend? Somebody say chu shi, right? So trend is Chu Shi. And what is deviation? Well you look at this graph, you guess what is deviation. Here you wrote percentage deviation from trend. What does that mean? What? Uh, yeah, so But what is pian time means here? What does it does here? And what is, does that has to do with trend? No one? Yeah, how much away is from the trend? Basically, that's it. So we, we know that in general, the trend is increasing, right? Especially for GDP, you should know that. We usually have a positive GDP increase, right? So GDP, the whole trend is going up. But the, along this trend, our GDP is actually going sort of, in terms of period, is up, up and down. Okay. We sort of divide the actual, DV, actual GDP from this trend. What's the difference between that and the trend? That's why it looks like this. Overall, the difference is going to be zero. See that? Because you divide it from the trend, so overall there's no increase. All the increase is, increase is in trend. Or even there's a decrease, the de decrease is in trend. So if I remove the trend, what you left here is something sort of goes up and down, up and down, and around zero. Okay? That's a very, very, very common graph that you will see in macroeconomics. You definitely see this kind of graph before, if you have ever taken a macro class. Okay. Um, so the idea here is that we don't really focus on the trend. We want to see the deviation from trend. That's the key thing that we want to capture. What caused the GDP to go up and down around the trend? 
And you can see here, although the, blue, uh, the black line doesn't really exactly capture the blue line, but the black line is pretty close to the blue line. Right? That's why um, this model is called the RBC model, Real Business Cycle Model. This school of macroeconomy believed that the basic force of economic growth was driven by uh, this increase of total factor product of productivity. Okay. And this is sort of their evidence. Okay. But what is causing um, the overall trend increase in GDP, for example? This is um, the government expenditure as a percentage of GDP. As how much of your GDP is used in government expenditure. That's G in our model. Okay. And you can see, you might think that the government, this is US data, but I mean, if you have a little bit idea of the US government, you would think that the US government is actually increased over time. But what you see here is actually a decreased trend. And the reason is that people's idea of this, how much the government spend is not just the government expenditure. It also includes the so-called transfer. Okay. What is transfer? Transfer means something you move from A to B, right? Here, what it means is you move something from the rich guy to the poor guy, basically. So that sometimes we call that social welfare. Okay? So this kind of transfer expenditure is actually this this increase the whole trend. So the US government are actually spending more and more money. But it's not on the usual government expenditure, such as building new air air airport or new rail or, or something like that, but more on spending on this uh, social welfare. And for that, that's quite different. That's not really gonna, well, so the key message we're delivering here is that from this graph, you should be able to see that, okay, this kind of increase doesn't really explain the data that well as the uh, solo residuals here. Okay, that's their, this school's evidence saying that. So we know that increase of G, this Keynesian's idea, that it will also increase Y. But what is really driven the, the growth of Y, GDP? It didn't seem like it's the, um, it's the government expenditure or the, even the total government outlays. And now we're gonna turn the model we turn uh, we learn in this chapter to a um, different level or to a different aspect. Okay, we want to um, we want to change the tax so to to a proportional tax. Okay, so what is proportional tax? It means it is depends on your wage, total wage you earn. That's the, usually the income tax you will pay when you go to, the, go to work. Okay, suppose you, um, the, the, the income tax is usually a percentage of your income. In Taiwan, that's actually an increasing um, percentage. The first few, uh, say, I don't remember the exact number, but maybe 80,000 or 800,000, the tax rate is low, but over beyond that, the tax rate can be really high. Like if you have a really, really high income, your tax rate, I believe in Taiwan is around 25%. Okay. So either way, that's a percentage. But in our, in our previous model or so far, the model we talked about, you don't pay a proportional tax, you pay a fixed tax. Even if you don't work, you still pay amount of tax. That's like 
no matter you work or not, you have to pay maybe ten thousand uh, New Taiwan dollar per year as a tax. Everybody has to pay, even if you you are a student, you still have to pay. But if even if you are super wealthy, you still pay the same amount. That's called a lump sum tax. Proportional tax is like everybody pay a a, a percentage. Okay, and we will use this model to study the um, income tax uh, incentive effect. That's how income tax, the usual income income tax in many countries, will change the incentive in this kind of economy. And we will derive the so-called Laffa curve. You should learn this in your first year uh, economic course in, in undergrad. Laffa curve is a relationship between what? Between your tax rate, percentage of tax rate, and total amount of tax that you can raise, the government can raise. The idea is that if the tax rate is really high, actually people don't have an incentive to work. So the total amount of working hours is lower. You actually don't earn that much tax. Don't don't actually get that much tax. Okay. So in this model, the key is the proportional tax. So we want to make this model simpler. So this is a model without capital. Okay, so there's no capital. Labor is the only input. But we still want to make this a constant return to skill. So since it, labor is the only input, and we want it to be constant return to scale, it must be a linear function, linear production function, like this. Y equals Z times N. And in that case, the production possibility from tier will become what? Okay, so remember, C is Y minus G, or Y is C plus G. That's the same thing, right? And y is what? y is z times n. And n, n d is still h minus leisure. Right? And remember, the production possibility from here is a relationship between c and l. So I need to make the l appear here and c appear here. And everything else should be constant. z, h, g are all constant here. Only C and L are endogenous variable here. And consumer's budget constraint. Remember, in the old model, the production possibility from tier is the same as consumer's budget constraint. Here is uh, a bit different. Why? Because the tax actually is proportional. Okay, so here, C equals what? C used to be W times H minus L, that's how many hours you work times the wage rate plus the dividend minus the T, right? Now we don't have this lump sum tax, so this one is dis disappear. And now I actually tax you, I tax you how much? The tax rate, the percentage is T. So if you totally earn W times H time minus L, then the tax can be T times this. So what are you left? How much left that you can use to consume? It's gonna be one minus T times H minus L times W. Is that clear? Okay, so that's how we, you know, uh, we based on the assumption we have, we change the model parameter. Okay? So profit for the firm is gonna be what? Profit for the firm pi is gonna be y minus w and d. That's the same. That's remember this is uh, the firm's cost. Now it's the only cost, because they only hire labor. And there's no tax here because the tax. It's paid by the consumer, right? That, so there's no, there's no T here. And Y is what? 
y is z times nd. So z times nd minus w times nd equals z minus w, the whole thing, times nd. N. Okay, so since you have this, this assumption, uh, this equation, you can plug this back to here. Plug back to here, the pi here. You know pi must equal to z minus w times n. Then you will find that c equals z times uh, 1 minus t times h minus l. Here, there's a key, key here, which is z in the equilibrium, z must equal w, and pi must equal to 0. And th this is actually quite a key that many of you don't understand why that's the case. Okay, so we will... Uh, so I will do this uh, more, more, okay, so I, I will make this clearer for you guys. Okay, so here we see that pi is z minus w times <coughs> nd, and this is labor demand. That, that's how much the firm want to hire. Okay, suppose Z doesn't equal W. Suppose Z is greater than W. If Z is greater than W, Z is greater than W, so that means this number is positive, right? If this number is positive, what is the number of ND that can maximize the pi? Remember, that's the assumption for the firm. Firm want to maximize pi, right? So if this is a positive number, say 2, what is the ND that can maximize the payoff, the, the pi? Yeah, infinity, right? The higher the ND, the better the payoff is. So it must not be the case in equilibrium, right? Because in equilibrium, it cannot be the case that the labor demand is infinity, right? Otherwise, I mean, it must mean that because in equilibrium, labor demand must equal labor supply. If labor demand is infinity, then labor supply must be infinity, and that means the consumer must work for infinity number of hours, but he or she only have H hours. So it's impossible. So must not be the case. Okay. But how about if Z is less than W? That means Z minus W is a negative number. What is the optimal level of ND? What, what number of ND can maximize the payoff? What? Zero. Yeah, zero, right? Because the number here is negative. Any positive number here, I mean, obviously we cannot hire minus number of labor demand. So the only thing we can do is make this zero. But if that's the case, that means, again, labor demand is zero in equilibrium, labor demand must equal labor supply, that means the total labor market gonna choose a level of labor equal to zero. And if it is zero, that means there's no output. This whole model collapse. So it must not be the case. So this is impossible. This is, uh, sorry. This is impossible. The only, this is called the Trinity rule in math. You, two number must either one is greater than the other or the other way around or the two things are equal, right? So it must be that Z is equal to W in equilibrium. And if Z is equal W, that means pi must be zero, right? So actually, this thing goes up. There's no pi. 
And because here we write w, but because z equals w, we can replace the w here with z. So c must be equal to z times 1 minus t times h minus l. Remember here z, h, l, and, oh, sorry, not l. z, h, t, these are all, all constant or exogenous variable. Only C and L here is endogenous. This is what the consumer face as a budget constraint. Budget constraint is also a relationship between C and L. But, and in the old model, that's the same as PPF, but here is different. What, what's different? Okay, this is the production possibility from tiers, frontier in the simplified model. Basically, um, these things. See, this is C equals Z times H minus L minus G. So Z times H is a constant. So this is ZH, one constant, minus Z times L minus G. Minus G and ZH can be seen as one constant. Right? So this is a linear function. Can you see that? This is what? Middle school mass. Right? Middle school, in middle school, you should be able to tell whether that's a linear function. So that's this line. You can actually verify this. Okay, when L is 0, your C is going to be ZH minus G. Let's verify that. When L is zero, that means this thing goes out, then C must equal to ZH minus G. ZH minus G, right? And then the slope must be what? Must be this minus Z, right? So if you have one point and a slope, then you can draw the, uh, production possibility from here. Or we can verify that when C is zero, the leisure is going to be H minus G divided by Z. Okay? Okay, now let's see, what's the revenue for the government given the number T? Since we have the PBF and the budget constraint, we can, we, we know that this is C, right? This is also C. These two must equal to each other, right? So Z H minus L minus G must equal to Z one minus T H minus L. And Z times H minus L, that's this times this times the whole thing, right? So what left here is going to be uh, minus T, uh, Z minus, minus Z T times H minus L. And then you move this to here, you get uh, hmm? sorry, it's a little bit mess. Actually, I can move this directly to here. So it becomes Z minus T H minus L. Okay, that's right. 
minus g equal to this and these two things cancel out. So g equal to z times t times h minus l. Here I wrote l of t, that means leisure is going to be a function of t. Because remember here, the leisure is an endogenous variable. It depends on t. Okay? Okay, this is the labor demand curve in the simplified model. Like I said, it must be z equal w. That's a straight line, like this. It cannot be a positive demand or a negative demand. Either way, it's impossible, because z must always equal w. Okay. And then, the competitive equilibrium in this simplified model with proportional tax. Here, this is the PPF. This is the budget constraint. Okay. What is a little bit strange about this model is that this line doesn't relate to T, right? Only this line is related to T. So we actually adjust the T. So when T goes uh, when t goes up, this whole thing goes down. But basically, we can, if we move the t, this is the slope that is changing here. So this point doesn't change. So it is this point moves up or down, right? And what we need is that because consumer is maximize his or her utility based on budget constraint, right? So it must be the case that. Uh, there's an indifference curve passing through the in equilibrium point. Here it's H. But it, it must be the case that H happens to be the intersection point of these two lines, budget constraint, the budget constraint and the PBF. And it also happens to be the maximized utility point H. That must be the same point. If for example, the T is so that this line looks like this, and then the maximized utility consumption bundle is here. It's not this point where these two lines interact with each other. What that means is there is no equilibrium because this two point, that means the, the society want to produce at this point, want to collect this amount of tax, but the consumer only want to work, uh, work this hours so that maximize his, his or her utility. That two thing doesn't match. Okay? So given a, so the, the whole thing is goes, the, the whole logic goes like this. You have an amount of G. That's how much the government is going to spend. Then, because G equals to this, Z times T times H minus L, I must find the right T such that the total amount of tax that I collected equals to G, so that it will be clear, the market will clear. So I move up and down, and then until I find a specific T that makes the maximized utility bundle equal to the intersection of two points. That's the key. And in fact, you will find that Given different level of G, the tax rate, there's at least two tax rates that you can use to gather the same amount of tax. So that the curve, the so-called lava curve looks like this, is a inverse U. That means, obviously, if you, the tax rate is zero, you cannot collect any tax. And if the tax rate is one, tax rate is one means that no matter how many hours you work, you earn zero. You pay everything to the government. Then nobody wants to work. 
right? Nobody want to work the amount of tax you collect, also zero. So the, the curve looks like this, so that given any level of G, I have two T, T1 and T2, which give you the same answer, same amount of G that you can collect. What that means is, before I say you adjust T, so that the, uh, the, the optimization point is the same point as the intersection point between PPF and budget constraint. But I didn't say there's only one point, one T that achieved this goal. Actually, there's at least two T, except for one level of G where basically this level of G, then there's only one T that can, the T star. It's the only level that's only one T. And the graph looks like this. So this is T2, this is T1. Two different T level, but the maximized point, this maximized point is H, this maximized point is F. Also, they are both the intersection of these two lines. Okay? So the idea is here is that if you want to collect a specific amount of government spending or a specific amount of tax that you want to collect as the government, you're really not free to choose any tax level, tax rate, sorry. You need to choose a specific tax level so that actually people will act the same way as they want, you want them to and you can collect the same amount of tax. Otherwise, the whole thing won't be in equilibrium. Okay? Any question? This is quite different from the previous model we talked about. So, I mean, people should have questions. I mean, it's, I mean, I, it's really hard for me to imagine that every one of you understands this perfectly right now. It's normal that you have some questions right now. Okay.